Good afternoon. My name is Kim Jones Ewers, and I am the Diversity Equity, Interim Diversity Equity and Inclusion Officer here for the library. I have the pleasure of introducing Kevin D. Richardson today. April 19, 1989, started off as a normal day for 14 year old Kevin D. Richardson. But that night would change the course of his life and American society forever. After the brutal attack and and assault in Central Park, the New York Police Department rounded up and arrested a total of 10 suspects, including Richardson. Despite there being no DNA and no evidence connecting himself and the four other teens to the crime, Richards Richardson was charged and sentenced to serve five to 10 years in jail, serving seven years. In 2019, uh, Netflix released When They See Us, a miniseries portraying the famous events of the case. The celebrated and award-winning show has brought the injustices, injustices Richardson and the Central Park Five, now the exonerated five, experienced back into the public's attention. 30 years later, Kevin Richardson is an advocate for criminal justice reform and uses his personal experience with false co coercions and unjust convictions to bring about change. He has partnered with the Innocence Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to exonerating wrongfully convicted people through DNA testing. In addition, Syracuse University created the Our Time Has Come, or the OTHC, Kevin Richardson Scholarship. The scholarship fund, named after Richardson, focuses on people of color, and helps them achieve an education when they might not have had the financial means to do so. Please join me and welcome Kevin D. Richardson to the stage. Mr. Richardson. First of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, I came here, I was here yesterday, I spoke to a few students, I'm back again. All this performance I've seen and the people I see here gives me inspiration because I'm just as equally inspired as you are of me. And one thing that I like to speak about amongst many is, well, two things, is hope. Hope, hope is a big word for me, and resilience. First of all, who's seen when they see us, by the way? All right, we need more hands up there, so. If, uh, I don't know where you've been at, but you should go check out Netflix, it's streaming right now, by Ava DuVernay. And like I said on this show called, When They See Us Now, presented by Oprah Winfrey, when I mentioned this, this sentence, I didn't believe that it would be like this. I said, it's painful, but it's necessary. This needs to be watched because not only did this tr happen truly in 1989, it's real. And this has been happening way before me. I advise you to Google a few people. Scottsboro's Boys. Myself and my brothers are the modern day Scottsboro's Boys. Emmett Till. These things that happen over and over again, and still happen, it's a revolving door. And my mother used to tell me, ironically, my mother name was Grace. And she was my angel during this whole time, and still is to this day. I remember that time when I actually got incarcerated, she feared for her son's life. Like a lot of black mothers fear for their children when they leave the house. One day, one Easter day, 1989, I never returned home. From going out, playing basketball, returning home seven years later. I didn't know what I was about to encounter. Quite honestly, it was like a dream that I didn't wake up from. But my mother always told me to keep your head up high. I really didn't know what that meant at 14 years old. Because at that age, a lot of us are still trying to find ourselves. Sure, honestly, adults are still trying to find themselves. So it's quite natural for a 14-year-old not to know what's going on. 
And during that time, all I remember was thinking, be hopeful. Hearing my mother's words, hearing grace, my angel, saying be hopeful. Even though it was stacked against me, I remember when I was on trial, October 11th, 1990. The day that I got sentenced was December 11th, 1990. And I received 13 counts of guilty from sodomy, rape, attempted murder, unlawful entry, rioting, this, it goes down, down the line. And I remember being in court, thinking that my life was over. And it was a scene that wasn't actually put in When They See Us, that when I was on trial, myself and Corey Wise, my mother fainted in the, court, in the courtroom. Um, and she had a mild heart attack, actually, and had a stroke. When I look back, I thought it was the last time I'll see my mother. And her last picture of her son was being shackled. And the judge, my, my sister Angela, which is in when they see us, she said, can we please give my, my uh, brother his coat because it's cold. And the judge said, no, send him to the back with the rest of them. And I'm sure y'all know who them was. It was people that looked like us, people that resemble us. And even in that time, I thought, be resilient, Kevin. Think about what your mother said. Even though I just received 13 counts. I thought my word was over. But something told me to stay strong. And it's a quote that I use often that resilience is in within all of us. We just have to find it deep inside. I personally believe my resilience and others start from when you're in your mother's womb. Because your mother carries you for nine months. She molds you to the person you are going to be today. So when you're put into this world, you're built to be a certain way. And I was built to be this way. People might see the finished product and think, oh, he looks well put together. He's nice. You know, I like to say smooth. <laughs> I'm from New York. But people don't see, I have these indelible scars that nobody else sees. It has been a journey and a half to go through what I've been through. And to be 48 years old, I've been fighting for all my, my, whole, my whole life, since 14 years old. All I knew how to do is fight, to be resilient, to be hopeful, to carry that hope. Not for myself, but others that's coming behind me. For others like Epic, which I love that name. For my daughters, I have two daughters, Jazeline and Jayla for them to carry on. In 1989, when uh, many people, one famous person you might know, but I'm not gonna mention his name because he either doesn't deserve the time right now. But the world was stacked against us. I grew up in a very religious household, Baptist. I went to church, Second Canaan Baptist Church in Harlem. But when I got found guilty and I was sentenced to five to 10 years in prison, I lost my faith. Because I thought, how can God do this to me? If he knows that I'm innocent, how can he do this? 
And my mother's from the South. She's from Norfolk, Virginia. Shout out to Norfolk. She said, boy, don't you ever judge the man upstairs. I said, yes, ma'am. And from that point, I didn't. Now, I have respect for everyone's religion, and I also studied it when I was in prison. In prison. But for me, it was God that helped me through this, and my family. As time went on, I became, I became older, growing up in prison, for 14 to the, rape, to the age of uh, 23 when I came home. Going through this, and I'm picturing it now. How can a child be hopeful doing all of this, right? It was hard. It was stressful. But we had to carry that, that burden on us to be so young. And there's two things that the world was scared of at the time, and not much has changed to be a black man, to be a teenager where the world thought the worst of us, where they called us animals. They called us wolf packs. It was one article when they said in the Daily News, in New York City, that they said these five boys deserved to be horse whipped in Century Park. And the eldest, which was Corey Wise, should be hung from a tree. That's not words you should say to anybody, nevertheless children. And even through all of that, I still kept my hope. And people say, how? I just had that strength from within to do so. It hasn't been easy to speak in front of crowds all these years, but as the years went on, it became therapeutic. When I was in prison, I didn't receive a therapy. Neither of my brothers received that. Because in prison, is just a, a, a human warehouse. And they don't give you these things. But I went out and obtained my associate's degree myself. I went to the law library to the law library and started to study why these things happened to me and what we can do to stop these things. So yes, I was incarcerated physically, but not mentally. My mental was still able to work over the years. And when I went to, um, well, when, when school came to us in prison, I obtained my associate's degree. Then I went on to Mercy College and was working towards my bachelor's degree. I didn't let it stop me. You know, over these last two years, it's been challenging for everyone. With COVID, with everything that's happening right now in this world, where people are being attacked of all races, and children are being attacked, women are being attacked live on footage. It's been rough. People are losing um, loved ones. Quite honestly, I lost about eight to 10 people over the last two years. My most precious is my oldest sister, Valerie. She passed in 2020 of uh, multiple myeloma cancer. And during all this, I still had to be Kevin Richardson, exonerated five, standing strong, but I am also human. I am also a man of God. So it was hard. I could have easily just went behind a cave and just said, leave me alone. But I know that I have a platform to speak about injustices, to raise awareness to people, for people that, I'm, that don't understand how it is for a person that looks like me. And I invite people that don't look like me 
if you want to learn more, go to the one that, that doesn't look like you and ask them about what they went through. Sometimes we need to speak about these things. I know a question was asked, what can we do as a society? And something I mentioned yesterday is that you don't have to be an activist to be active. Everyone doesn't have that strength to do so. You might be better at, on the computer. You might be better reaching out to your local politicians. But we all have to play a role of making things better. It's an organization called the Innocence Project, which I work for. And we all, they have those everywhere. And it's a nonprofit organization. People could go out and join these organizations to help out so you can see a change. Yes, I'm hopeful. Yes, I'm optimistic. But I'm also a realist. And I know things hasn't changed. It hasn't changed since I was a kid. It hasn't changed since my mother. When she grew up in the Jim Crow era. When my mother physically seen the KKK, Ku Klux Klan, young ones, where they drag people out their house. The same thing happened to myself and my brothers. Instead of being dragged out of our house, we was dragged off the streets and put into these jails. And they locked us, locked us away and threw away the key. So after doing seven years in prison, I come home in 1997. I'm 23 years old now, much bigger, trying to survive. And it was still stacked against me. I had to register under Megan's law, which is a law for sex offenders. I was labeled a rapist. Mind you, I grew up with five women in my household. My mother and four sisters. Fast forward today, I have two daughters. So it was crazy even to think that I would do something like that and my brothers. But we still had to, to right the wrong. We still had to get past that. And it took a long time to speak in front of crowds. And I've been blessed to speak everywhere from the smallest place to the biggest. But the message, doesn't, the message doesn't change. That we have to be resilient. We have to be hopeful. During these dark times, we still have to pay it forward and push forward. If you've seen when they see us, I don't want to give it away. But my brother, Antoine McCray, which in certain scenes, his father turned against him and made him say something. So I understand how he feels to this day. He still doesn't want to come out to society and speak because it's still so hurtful. It's still hard to talk about your life. But myself and two others, Raymond Santana, Yusuf Salam, we speak for everyone. We speak for our brothers that this story is not just our story. It's everyone's story that went through something similar. Yes, we've been highlighted for what we went through, but there are so many Century Park Fives, Exonerated Fives everywhere that don't get the recognition. So I'm being the voice for the voiceless. Fast forward to 2002, when my case got overturned, and I met a young lady named Sarah Burns, which I didn't know at the time. Her father was Ken Burns. And she said, my dad's going to work on a film for y'all. I said, who's your dad? And she's like, Ken Burns. I said, OK. Who's that? <laughs> a white man, you know, mid-aged man, but at the time. Sarah Kenna and Sarah's husband was the first people to give us a shot, to give us a chance. And when they came out with the doc, the Century Park Five in 2012, 
after that, it was still hard all these years to come out forward and speak. But when I met Ava DuVernay, my sister from a different mister, we had this bond that was so natural. And the only thing she wanted to do was tell our truth. She told me that. She said, brother, I just want you to tell your truth. Speak your story. We related so much because Ava grew up in Compton, California, where she went through similar situations as myself. And we, we went on to create When They See Us. It took four and a half years to make it because she wanted to get everything right. Now, it's, it's a blessing that I'm able to call her my sister and have her number. I could call Oprah. I could call Tyler Perry. I met Cicely Tyson when she told me, son, I'm very proud of you for what you're doing. Keep carrying the torch. That's what gave me motivation to do what I'm doing. That's motivation for me to keep paying it forward. It doesn't stop. It would be easy to be like, I'm done. I received my lawsuit. But don't judge a book by its cover. Like I said, you might see me with nice things on, but the money can't take back of what happened to myself and my brothers. There's no amount of money that could equal that. If I had a chance, give me my childhood back. Give me my youth back. I wanted to graduate in school. Instead, I got my GED in prison, which is still okay, but I would rather be outside doing that. I miss certain things of going to the prom, being very shy, asking somebody for a date. I miss that. I miss the puppy love. I'm gonna stop it there because there's young kids here. But I miss that, the <laughs> things like that. I have a 14 year old that's in high school, so I know. Oh yeah. But I'm so glad that my mother Grace Cuffey is still here to see what has happened to her son. My father, Paul L. Richardson, which passed in 2009, didn't did, he, he didn't get to see my case get overturned, but he's still watching. He's still proud of me. And my father, <laughs> my father was militant. Okay, you go in this house, Black everything. He taught me about my heroes. So at least he got to see me pursue my dream. Now my biggest dream, my biggest baby besides my kids, which was mentioned is the Kevin Richardson Scholarship Fund, which I would have never thought in my wildest dreams that even when I'm not here physically, my degree would carry on for people. And it's specifically for people with unmet financial needs. I focus on people of color, but it's for everyone. For people to get a degree because college is very expensive. And I'm so excited that starting next month, it would be the first two awardees for, to get their degree under my name. And I'm a very humble person, and you know, I don't like talking about my, my accolades, but this is something that needs to be shined on. You know what I mean? This is something that needs to be heard, because when things like this happen, they don't really speak about this on the news or tell people about what people are doing behind closed doors. Because I'm not one to step out and say, look at me, look what I'm doing, y'all. My work will show for itself. My proof will show. Five, my, the brothers are doing good. I spoke to one of Antoine yesterday, and he told me, Kevin, tell the people that I'm okay. Because he's the one that nobody sees. 
I spoke to Corey Wise a few days ago. And if you know Corey Wise, if you've seen when they see us, he's a different character. And he's been through so much. Not that only, we went through a lot, but Corey went through something totally different. Because at 16, he was labeled an adult. And he got uh, shipped straight to Rikers Island, which in New York is a harsh prison. And the things that happened to him is not even half of what really did happen to him. But because of that, Ava didn't want him to put all that out there just for him. And it's amazing, I think back to when I first came out of prison in 1997. <laughs> when I first came out in 1997, I didn't know what I was about to encounter. I was here, this 23-year-old kid under Megan's law and the whole world I felt hated me. But it was my mother still saying, be resilient, Kevin. Be hopeful. The truth will come out. You did? Mm -hmm. I'm so used to this, there's nothing. Um, she said to be resilient. And not that I know, Little did I know that all these years later, I'm still here. We're here. My people are here. So you might have speakers that come out and just talk about, hey, this is what I'm doing. And that. But I'm talking about realness and things that really happen and what can you, you can overcome if you just put your mind to it. And I know it's so cliche. The light, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. But it's true. It's true because when I was in that jail cell, Tom's crying behind those, those doors thinking I will never come home. There was light at the end of that tunnel that saying, come through, brother. Come through this light. And I did. And I'm so grateful that I did because now I'm here, I'm here today to speak to you all and people that just want to see me just want to hear me. You know, I grew up a shy kid in New York City, playing the trumpet. That was my way to let out my energy. I was nice in basketball too, ask about me. <laughs> yeah, I still got it. But, I know we're on schedule a little bit, but one thing I want to leave you all with when you're in your darkest corners and you feel like you want to give up or think that life is harsh, think about others that have been through things that's not to knock anybody's situation, but think about people that went through things that's so horrific, like myself, and I was able to push through it. I'm, I'm not going to lie and say it was easy. It was extremely hard, but I had to. I had to for my children that's following me right now. I had to for a generation that's coming behind me. It's mind boggling when this little kid came up to me one day and he said, Kevin Richardson, you're like an icon. I was, what? But then I said, you know what? I'm gonna carry that. I'm gonna carry that platform because each one teach one. Whatever you learn, pass it on to the next one. I'm still a sponge right now, absorbing knowledge, learning. So on that note, we're about to have some uh, Q&A. Please feel free to ask me anything you want. And I mean anything, because my life is an open book. One thing I will tell you right in advance, that one person I probably, and I won't speak about too much is I want him to say his name, because he doesn't even matter to me. Other than that, the floor is everyone. 
Thank you for having me. I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. When my case got overturned in 2000, 2002, actually, and even, my, even though my case was overturned, it felt like people were still saying we were guilty. We had the public saying that somehow it was a sixth person and they were saying somehow we were still in cahoots with the situation. I felt like it was time to stand up and tell people that it was not us, even after this. We, don't, we went on to file our lawsuit, right? And we fought for 10 more years. Um, Michael Bloomberg, yeah. They thought that, that we will give up and just say, no, we forget about it. But this was our livelihood that we were fighting for. And so it was time to stand up and speak to others and not be shunned by people. And that's what we had to stand up and say, here we are. Even when I was so young, we was gonna fight for what we believe in. And I remember being, when I was in court, they gave me different situations for a plea deal and I would not accept it because I would not you know, plead for something I didn't do. So I had the support of my community to give me that extra push to help out and stand strong. But it was, it was that time around 2002. And then when my case got overturned 10 years later, it gave me more energy to come out. And it was not until actually my brothers, Raymond Santana, Yusuf Salam, they were on the circuit at first speaking. And they told me, Kevin, you should come out. You should show your face. But I was scared because we had death threats from people. It was a thing called the Yellow Pages, young people, <laughs> back in the days. And people would find my mother's number in the Yellow Pages and call and say, your son deserves to be castrated and hang up. We know where you live and things like that. So it was, it was very fearful to come out because there's some crazy people out here. You know, but I had to, I had to do it. And going back to when I said, everyone has that inner strength from your mother's womb. I had that to come back out and do what I have to do. And now, because of that, now they can't keep us quiet. Now they woke up sleeping giants. Great question. I'm glad you bring that up, because mental health is real. OTSD is real. I have both. And when I say I'm human, I still go through these things. Despite everything I've been through and the celebrity status, I still have my days when I'm like that. There's times where I'm just upset. I'm angry at the world. But then I thought, I can't be bitter. And this, this, might, this might be a question, so I don't want to support the question, but people often ask me this. How come you're not bitter? I didn't want to grow old and be an angry, bitter man that's mad at the world. Don't get it wrong, we were very upset what happened to us. But I had to channel that, that bitterness, that anger, that aggression, and transform it to something positive like I'm doing today. But it's been a challenge and it's been hard. If I'd have held on to that bitterness, I might not be here today. Because I believe bitterness will take you to the grave faster. And I didn't want that. I don't know about you all, but I want to live. I've been through so much. But I do have a therapist. I do. Yeah. And for like everyone, especially the last two years with COVID, with people passing away, I lost my oldest sister, which was like my second mother. I lost my best friend. I lost my cousin. The list goes on. 
my wife just lost her grandmother and her uncle last week. So it's been challenging. I have therapists, and my wife is my number one therapist that I speak to all the time. And my kids, actually. Because when I come home from being Miss Kevin Richardson, I'm just dad. I come and talk to them. My four-year-old, like, hey, daddy. Hey, what's up? You got the toy for me? <laughs> and I love it because I'm just regular at home. And I come with my 14-year-old, like, welcome back. I need you to help me with this math equation. You know, so things like that. But I would love people that's dealing with mental health not to be shy and afraid of it because you have to embrace that. And it's real. And sometimes as men, and honestly, as men of color, we're afraid to, like, no, we don't want to tell people about our, our, what we've been through and, and feel, like, inferior. But when you let people into your world and open up, it really changes you and makes you become a better person. So mental health and PTSD is real. And if you do deal with that, please find someone that you can relate to and speak to them. It will do better for you. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, in 2012, I came out. But as years went on and on, but when, when they see us came out, it really gave us that strength to go out in the circuit. And then not to mention, we had a team behind us. We had Ava, we had Oprah, we had Robert De Niro. They all was part of the, the process. So it was easy to see who we had behind us, you know, to come out. Um, but even then, you know, we were still wondering how would people welcome us. People that knew us knew that we didn't do this crime, but you have people that still will believe something else. And we have people that's like, like the DA, Elizabeth Letherer, that believe they lie so much they actually believe it. So people that's like that, we just leave them where they at and just continue on with life, but it definitely was hard. You know, it's so many cases like that that's not mentioned. And it's shameful that we still have these cases that's open, that's not resolved or not solved. And my thoughts on, on that is that when is it going to be resolved? Enough is enough, right? But after we do go through one case, here comes another. And that's why we have to stand strong together. And I always say it takes a village to fight. I remember going to court and we used to say, it's time for war. And not physically, but it was time to fight, quote unquote, the oppressors and everything that we was going through. So we have so many cases like this that still need to be resolved and still, and still open. And because I have the platform, I must raise awareness about it. And that's my job to do so. And that's why I believe passionately about these situations. And I often you know, um, offer people to look into these cases that's still going on. All you have to do now, kids and everybody, Google. Google's your friend, right? Google about these situations. They'll let you know about it. And myself and the Innocence Project, we're constantly working on cases, the ones that's highlighted and the other cases that people don't know about. Because there's so many people that's incarcerated or their cases is unresolved. That's kind of a, a quick question. <laughs> Absolutely not. But I'm a realist. I would love to be optimistic, but it's been a snail's pace all these years. Something has to change. What do we need to do? What, what else do we need to do? But we have to keep on fighting. But one thing I would like to say, um, uh, Yusuf Salam, my brother, one change is that he's running for city council in New York. You know, and that's where we could start. So he's running for, actually as of yesterday, he's running for city council in Harlem. So I will be there in the forefront with him and maybe that could be the start of something.
I like that. And the key word you said, progress of awareness. Because people are becoming more aware of situations because of the day and age we live in. We have younger people now that wants, want to change. And because of modern technology, we're more aware of things that's happening, like uh, George Floyd. Because name there's so many. I'm all, I mean, I'll, it'll be forever talking about the people that we see these things happening to. But I'm hopeful about the awareness and because of the next generation that they could push the envelope and pay it forward. Um, and hopefully that could transform into actual things happening. But at least we're aware about it. And my, one of my jobs is to raise awareness or be the voice of the people that's voiceless. Every student that had the courage to write a poem will receive a gift card today. The 10 that have been selected today are here. They will perform. And after the readings, we want everyone that did a poem to come to the stage for a group picture. Our first poet is Leela Archery. Life is a game full of challenges, some simple, some sweet, like passing a test or riding a bike or even taking a very long hike. But not all challenges are easy. Some are difficult, some even hurt. And sometimes you don't even see when a person is fighting their battles within until they lose. Life isn't easy, they say when you complain. Life just isn't fair. But if you tell them to walk a mile in your shoes, oh no, they wouldn't dare. This is for the ones with silent struggles and pain you just can't see, because they are the true overcomers and maybe stronger than you and me. Thank you. Our next poet is Liliana Lozano. Um, OK. Um, it's a message to my eating disorder. It says, I know that this is not what you hope for, for me to recover, looking in the mirror every day and wishing I was different. I know you wince every time I take a bite, and I know that you are scared, because regardless of how loud you yell, how strong your grip is around my throat, I continue to take a bite after bite. I know that you are, I know that when I look in the mirror and a tear does not fall down my face, you become furious. When I congratulate myself for getting rid of you, it only infuriates you more. But I have something to tell you. No matter how hard you push, how much you resist, I will not listen. The rolls of my stomach will sit on full display. The calories in my food will sleep in my blood. I will eat an entire meal, and I will eat another, and then another. I will fight with every breath, every bite. I will fight you until you are no longer strong enough to fight back. Checkmate. I win. All right. The next poll we have is Sabella Sanders. Um, this is called The Real and Reality. Picture this, a white boy comes up to a black girl. Why do you live in your imagination? Why do you seem like you're always faking? Why can't you live in the real world? Why does she live in her imagination? Why do I live in my imagination? Pretend like I'm going to all sorts of places. Feels like it's so real. What's my deal? Maybe it's because the world she was given is not as good as the world she could live in. Maybe it's because she was taught to be Wonder Woman when she's just a wondering woman. Maybe it's because she can't even imagine a world where murder is something everyone is punished for. Maybe it's because she was taught to be four times better, like Harriet, Rosa, Shirley, May, and so many more. These overcomers, and from everything they came, and everything they became. Maybe in her own world, under her own alias, with her own friends, she could fix every disease. And not just the ones that make you ill, but the ones that make you treat others ill. Maybe in the world she created, everyone kept their gaze transfixed on preserving this beautiful race we call humans. All in a fraction of a section, she thought that. But yet she said she had no answer for the boy. Her silence created a stigma, and that stigma created a sentence. The sentence being that she was strange, she was OK. She was less than, she was angry. Use your voice, they say, but how can I when my country is deaf? An obstacle we all must get beyond every day, a battle fought, a hill overcame, continue in the race, never stop for fame. How can we take the broken constitution and piece it back together all while etching in the real and reality? Maybe someday, when the girl's imaginary world is reality, the real and reality will retire as the placeholder for hope. 
our next poet is Angelica Adams. One thing, um, a little bit of context before I read my poem. My poem is about um, the burgundy ribbon, which stands for multiple myeloma, the type of cancer my dad has. <sighs> burgundy ribbon, burgundy ribbon, fly the fly. Oh, burgundy ribbon, burgundy ribbon, those people hang you in the sky. They wear you proud. They wear you to show what they're going through, and they aren't afraid to say it out loud. Burgundy ribbon, burgundy ribbon, you symbolize their health. But yet they will not quake nor break from the damage that has been dealt. They fight for their lives, tearing down every boundary that has been built. They break the walls, bend the bricks. They fight the fight till the cancer hits. But burgundy ribbon, they do not let their cancer eat away from their lives. Even if it eats their bones, they are strong till they die. And that's why, Burgundy Ribbon, they hang you in the sky. Our next poet is Brandon Blackburn. Broken Walls. Broken Walls tell a story of drunken fists and a man broken by drugs. A once convict reporting himself for a crime he'd never dare commit. Three young boys, woken from slumber. One, awake through the thick of it. My eyes wide, scared of what happened next. That awake boy was me. He is an upstanding man, a role model, fallen to fleeing from those to make him well. He is needed in my life. He is a better man. These broken walls tell his story. The next artist, or a poet rather, I'm sorry, Catherine Ortiz Rosales. How Could It Be So Cruel by Catherine Ortiz Rosales. You're on the way to school. You start thinking they might finally upset you for being you. You sit in class in a moment of silence. They start laughing at you. They start laughing, the, saying the most hurtful things, saying that you are unlovable, telling you the how they wish you were dead. Taking every word like a powerful bullet through your heart, you start breaking down, bursting out tears. They start laughing at you. You were in desperate need of help. You were submerged in fear. You couldn't speak up, so you thought you were alone. People who knew what was going on, they just did nothing. They didn't care you, that you were hurting. They were treating you like if you were worthless. Taking, you have upset the defeat. You were drowned, drowning in your own tears. You start to sink in the deep dark hole of depression. They, they have brainwashed you into thinking you were a nobody. But deep down, you were hurting. They treated you like a worthless piece of nothingness. You didn't deserve it. You were strong, taking every, every word, you, every word, every bullet. You stayed strong for who knows how long, but one day you just had enough of them mistreating. You finally stood up for yourselves, silent. No one was. You finally stood up for yourselves, since no one was there for you. You become even stronger. You swore that nobody would treat you like that ever again. You overcame the obstacle. Everything that you had thrown at, that had, that they had thrown at you. You toss it back 10 times even stronger. You overcame the struggle. Our next poet is Zachary Dixon. All my life, I've been a girl. That dress of mine, doing a twirl. Pink bows, frilly dresses. You'll marry a prince and be queen, they say. Now go on and play. But I've hated it. I wanted to be a boy, a king, a man. I wanted to be a boy, but I'd be a dyke to others. I wanted to be a boy, but I'd be get, pa get picked last in dodgeball. I wanted to be a boy, but I'd get spitballs thrown like a battle has commenced. I wanted to be a boy, but I must live with the fact that, with the thought that I will never be good enough to be a man. 
And even then, I will still stand above the odds and remember myself. Yeah, I'm a boy, but I'll always remember that little girl, that Zoe in me that made me the Zach I am today. No matter how much people appreciate the Zach I am, I will always appreciate the Zoe I was three years ago. Our next poet is Evan Morgan. All right, this poem is called Spectacle. Just be yourself. A saying said so easily, it rolls off the tongue like it's supposed to be something easy, like turning off a light or shutting a door. So I do it, I be myself, but to some that saying does not accommodate all of me, the part of me that I love unconditionally, the part of me that means the most to me, the part of me that's my unchosen destiny met with so much hate and hostility, the part of me that makes people stare at me like I'm some kind of novelty, like, an, like I'm an animal at the zoo, locked in a glass cage while people hear me roaring, this is me, but failing to hear me, a spectacle. That's how they treat me, like I'm not somebody, but rather something. But I guess I am different, right? How my love is different from the norms set in our society. How my family will be different from the stereotypical family. How my love is different from the books we read in school. And God forbid that be the case, the book will be banned by each school like some kind of race. A race to take away a child's safe space. A race to be the one who exhibits the most hate. And whoever can be the loudest with their hate wins. They win a platform, a following. A following from people just like them. They're the ones outside the glass. They're the ones who stare and laugh, who call me names as they pass, while all I try to do is my best. My best not to judge, not to raise a finger, not to use my words, because that would make me just as bad as them. All I do is love, but somehow that's made me the spectacle all along. We have our last poet, Chanity Brooks. Hi, my poem is titled, We the People. I was told to write a poem about something meaningful. I sat in deep thought, thinking about what bothered me most. Then I knew exactly what I was going to write about. Ending racism is something so meaningful to me, and not only me, but my peers and my community. Listen closely. We are all told as kids that we can be whatever we want as long as we put our minds to it, but it's a little different for us. If this is so true, why did it take us over 200 years to elect the first African-American president? And not only that, but we are still repeating the same patterns that perpetuates the unfair treatment and oppression of people of color. We got to stop this. We need to stand up, speak up, and look up. Not only do we need to look up, but we need to look around. Use our eyes. That's what they're there for. Not just to see, but to acknowledge. Look at the world in my eyes. Why does my skin color matter? It doesn't make me any less smart, stupid, beautiful, or ugly. We are all equal, we are all humans, and should have equal rights. I'm not too young to speak up or stand up, nor are you too old to speak up or stand up. So why don't we all rise together? Rise as a nation, but we are stuck divided by our sexualities, beliefs, body types, and skin tones. We all look different, but we have the same organs and cells. We are all human, so why in this cruel, cruel world do we all seem to be so different? The first three words of the Constitution are very meaningful. We the people. We the people, not I the people, not you the people, but we the people. Thank you. Thank you.